is everybody doing tonight? Are you good? Man, what an incredible, incredible night. You have picked an amazing time to be here tonight. I honestly believe it is gonna be a special, special night in uh, the history of young adults. Uh, anybody here for the first time tonight? Anybody here visiting for the first time? Raise your hand. All right, you, sir. Come here real quick, I got something for you. What's your name? Kevin. Everybody say hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Kevin, for spending your Thursday night with us, I want to give you and your friend that you came with some coffee in the morning. So thank you for coming and hanging out. Absolutely. Give it up for Kevin. Hey, I feel like I, I owe somebody a personal apology up here. I wore my, my Celtic green shoes tonight. Uh, my boy Damon, hailing from Boston, is a Celtics fan. None of you care, but the Celtics won the NBA Finals. I was making fun of Damon a couple weeks ago, so decided to wear my Celtics shoes. Hey, whether um, you've been here for the first, whether you're here for the first time, or maybe this is your hundredth time at Young Adults, our hope in doing um, a, a gathering on a Thursday night is to have conversations relevant to our young adult, young professional age. Um, and shine light on reasons why we believe it's reasonable to have faith, why there's reason for hope, and why we actually believe that you can live and lead a life through the lens of love. Um, and maybe you're in here tonight, and um, I don't know, like the storm of the coming election is already kind of like peeking through the mountains, and maybe you have debt, and maybe you're going through a breakup, and maybe it just seems like life is tough. I honestly believe that tonight there's a reason for hope. And so whether, like I said, whether it's your first time here or your 100th time here, I want to ask you tonight to maybe lower any guard that you might have in your heart. Maybe you're very skeptical of faith. Maybe you're skeptical of church. And for you stepping into this room in this environment is like you are having an out-of-body experience. Don't worry. We're not going to ask you to drink anything weird or eat anything weird. Um, my only request of you tonight would be to consider maybe the possibility that there is truth and that there is life in the message that we're going to receive tonight coming from what I believe to be the Word of God, the Bible. Um, and so we are about to go into another moment of worship. Um, and afterwards, I'm going to come back up and actually have an incredible announcement for you that I'm going to make. Um, and we're going to dive into the message. But could you just do me a favor? I don't normally do this, but it feels like appropriate in this room. Could you just, in whatever way you feel comfortable, posture your heart to receive from God. So if that's you, if you want to close your eyes, if you want to raise your hands, if you just want to sit there with your hands in your pockets, that's totally fine. And in whatever way you feel comfortable, I believe that we're going to receive and hear from God tonight. So Jesus, we come before you tonight, open and available. God, we want you to speak. I believe that you're real, and I believe that you speak to us. I believe that there's people in this room that have never heard your voice before, and my prayer is that tonight they would hear you for the first time. I believe that there's people in this room that haven't heard your voice in a long time, and maybe they feel like they've disqualified themselves from being in a relationship with you, or maybe that their choices or decisions or mistakes have disqualified them. I pray that they, you would speak to them and that they would hear your voice, maybe for the first time in a long time. God, I pray that you would just draw us close. It's our honor and our joy to worship you tonight. And everybody in this room said, amen and amen, Why? let's worship.
for just a moment. And please hold all applause until I'm done. Not for me, not applause for me, that would be weird. Um, I, I am so excited for tonight. I honestly believe that tonight is this like mile marker in the ministry um, and in just like the history of young adults. For a long time, um, young adults team has been very, very fluid to say the least. And we have just been praying for people that are passionate about communicating to and pastoring and reaching this next generation of young adults and young professionals. Um, and so she is nobody new to our stage. We used to call her a friend. For the past four years, Casey Mexico has been building one of the best uh, youth ministries here at our church up in Arvada. I said, hold your applause. No, I'm kidding. Um, but tonight, it is my joy and my honor to introduce Casey Mexico as somebody who is joining the Young Adults Pastoral Staff, the Young Adults Pastoral Team. She will be helping teach, communicate, lead our amazing teams, and just um, bring vision and passion to reaching as many young adults um, in the city of Denver as physically possible. And so, would you join me in helping welcome one of the newest pastors in our young adult team, Casey Mexico, let's go! It's a lot of drums. A lot of... Wow, Aaron on the drums, am I right? Hey guys. What's up? How are you? Uh, for those of you that don't know, I was a youth pastor and now I'm here because I feel like um, after a lot of prayer, uh, I was like, man, I'm, I love teenagers. I like the most sarcastic person in a room and that's typically a teenager. Uh, but when I was praying, I was like, God, do I stay? Do I go? And I felt like it was like, what new thing do you want to do in youth and in young adults and which one makes me and my spirit feel the most like I'm going to need you to do it well and it felt like that was young adults and for me it's always been I want to choose whatever thing has me on my knees desperate for a word in the presence of Jesus because that's the best way I know how to lead and so I'm here um, and I have some former students in the room so make some noise <laughs> i I started youth ministry when I was 23, and so I'm 31 now, spoiler alert. Uh, younger than Connor, so it's fine. Um, so eight years of youth, but that means my oldest student is 26. So I've been pastoring um, them and a lot of students I still mentor, and so it doesn't feel like, who are these people? It feels like my people, and so it is an honor. I'm excited to get to know you, and you'll get to know me. It's gonna get a little rogue. Um, my thing is, I, I teach the word of God, and my I, I just wanna say, I love Jesus. Would you love him with me? That That's my leadership style. And so, the word that I have for you today, right before I dive into it, summer and young adults was actually the first time I became a disciple of Jesus. I was 19. I had been a Christian for three years, and it was my first summer back from college, and. I hated the church, to be honest. I, I love Jesus, but church people, I was like, nah, no thank you. Uh, I don't trust anybody. But my friends convinced me to go to a summer young adult Friday night thing, and it's when I fell in love with the Holy Spirit and when I fell in love with being a, a, a disciple of Jesus, which means following and practicing his ways. And it's funny, summer, I think sometimes we think, because a lot of us have it off, that God takes it off. But I actually think summer is some of the times where I see the Holy Spirit uh, actually bring forth a harvest unlike any other season. Because I think our hearts are not in our routine. And we're like, I, I feel more bored than usual. And I thought summer was gonna be uh, more of a rest, but uh, there's a lot of road work and it's hot and raining and I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And you kind of start being stuck with your thoughts a little bit more. And when you're stuck with your thoughts a little bit more, I think that we have a desperation for Jesus that just sometimes when we're busy, we don't have. And he meets us in desperation, young adult. And so today, the message that I have to bring to you is um, something God convicted me of last week. <laughs> I feel stuck in cynicism. 
And I've talked to a couple of young adults and they're like, what's that? <laughs> Lainey, <laughs> she's graduated from Baylor and doesn't know what cynicism means, so it's fine. <laughs> she was my intern, so I can make fun of her. Um, but I've struggled with this my entire 20s. And so today I'm gonna define it because I think the, 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 the thought in the room is that, oh, this message isn't for me. I just think this message is gonna be for every single person in the room because I think it's a cultural undercurrent and I think that we are drenched in it. And I don't think we understand just how stuck we are in it. It's an agreement with death when we have a living God who said he's brought new life. And so I'm gonna pray, but first I'm gonna read a little bit of a scripture that we'll return to at the end. Matthew 18, one to four. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child. Come on, no, I'm just kidding. Imagine if I brought a child. I don't know, it'd be so weird. Um, he put him in the midst of them. And he puts the child in the midst and they're all looking at the child and the child's probably like, do you have food? Do you have a snack? What's going on? He says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you convict us not to condemn us, but to set us free. And so Lord Jesus, oh, the fact that you reveal things to us when we couldn't see them ourselves and you say, be free, turn around, come towards me. God, I just thank you that your word does that and that your spirit does that. I thank you for the person in the room who's like, man, I did not want to come today, but I did. Thank you for their courage, God. That is not a small thing and you'll honor it. And so, Lord, thank you for your word. Hope we have fun tonight. Hope my voice doesn't go away. And I love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Sit down. Have a seat. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So um, I was a very cynical child. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, cynical children are hilarious in my opinion because the whole point of being a child is that you're like, you believe in Santa. So at youth, I accidentally spoiled that Santa's not real for half my students one year. So that was really fun. I was like, you're 11. Okay. Uh, so I, I was a cynical child, but the point of being a child is that they're not cynical, is that they have imaginations, that they believe in things easily, that they trust easily, right? Like if you see a van with the word candy on it, free candy, don't go to the van. Like you have to teach children that because they have an inherently natural trusting disposition. Now, I grew up in kind of a tougher household. My dad's on his fifth wife, if that's any indicator. I loved all of them, though. Uh, he just kind of sucks sometimes. So I had a hard childhood, and sometimes when you have a hard home life, you can get cynical pretty quickly. Um, and so I had my first CD. It was Avril Lavigne, Let Go. You know, I was like, life's like this. Like, burn. <laughs> like 10 years old, like, okay, your life's not that complicated. And then Green Day, uh, American Idiot was my second album. And I was just like, Boulevard of Broken Dreams, like, wake me up when September ends. It's like, you are a 10 year old girl. Like, what is wrong with you? I had an armband that had a flame on it that I, I, I still have, but I could not find for this message. I just wanted to roll up in it. They're like, oh, cool, who do we have now? Um, I was just really cynical. I did not know how to put on eyeliner, but if I did, I would have. And that was my vibe. And I was sort of like, oh, well, I've, I, most kids, like a lot of you maybe resonate, like you've gotten maybe more cynical, more distrusting, more like, okay, interesting, as you've gotten older as people have failed you, as you have seen more of the world, as you have access to information. If you turn on the news, it's from bad to worse to worse to bad. And all of this can lead us to being super cynical people. I used to be the girl that was on the airplane who would make a new friend. Not anymore. <laughs> the headphones stay on in the aisle, and if we do have a conversation, please don't ask for my name, or I'll give you a fake one. Where has that girl gone? <laughs> and it reminds me of this meme. I felt like it was a lot like little Dakota Fanning from Uptown Girls. Milana, you can run the clip. Take a look around. Do you see her anywhere? News flash. You're not gonna. <laughs> that was me at youth on my last sermon. Like 10 kids at talking. I'm like, oh, you want to talk during my message? I was like, it's my last night. Just ripping kids to shreds. 
I know. I was like, take a look around, little kid, and you don't even know I'm leaving after this. Yeah, I didn't say that, but I wanted to so badly. Um, that was, that's me. And so I've carried that with me into life. Just on my drive over here, there's traffic at 3 o'clock, and I say to myself, traffic and road work, doesn't anyone work a 9 to 5 anymore? Like mad that people are out on the road, but it couldn't be like, man, good for them that like maybe they got into work at six and maybe they have like a summer Thursday where they get off early. Like so cool that everyone's enjoying their summer. Maybe, maybe the parents are just like taking time to be with their kids this summer. No, no one works in nine to five anymore. And like, I have a night job now. So uh, like, why am I like this? So it's easy to slip into cynicism, and I'm going to go on to define it if you're in the room sort of confused, or maybe you've already looked it up on your phone, no judgment at all, but it's difficult to shake off. It's easy to slip into, it's difficult to shake off, but my, my guess would be that a lot of us don't think that we're stuck in it, and that can be one of the most dangerous things to fall into, is not knowing that we're stuck, but we're so deeply embedded in it, because well, my, my little illustration I have is like, kids used to throw staples into my hair in middle school. <laughs> Look at this hair. Like, it ate those staples alive. Like, I could not get them out later that night. It's easy to get in there, but it's really hard to get out. Bag of hot Cheetos, stick your hand in, take a couple. Those red, red fingers are going to be there for life. Like, easy to get in, hard to get out. And so I want to define it for you. Because here's what cynicism does. It says, I'm all alone. No one's going to look out for me but me. I've got me. You've got you. People are inherently trustworthy, and their motives are inherently selfish. And so if I can just take control of my life and be super careful about who I let in, even God, even church people, especially church people, then I'll be okay. Then I'll be safe because I'm the only one looking out for me. And if you're not careful, you'll banish people away until you're on an island by yourself but when Jesus comes to send you a lifeboat, you'll say you're on vacation. You'll get exactly what you think you want and then you'll wonder why you can't connect with anybody and like it's so hard to belong. Oh, it's so hard to connect and it's so hard to belong but people keep failing me and I just feel like I'm in a haunted house and I'm in the lobby at church and it's just when is someone gonna say something rude or, or racist or sexist? I'm just waiting to be disappointed in this place. And you're like, oh, this is how I, I felt on Sunday. I'm in this. I've been stuck in it more in my early 20s, but I still struggle to get in it. And so as I wrote this message, it was mostly so that I could get set free. And so you can come along. Cynicism defined as this. An inclination to believe that people are motivated purely by self-interest, contemptuously distrustful or skeptical of human nature and motives, the feeling of distrust or that something isn't going to work out well. Now, I'm going to define it. Is there any millennials in the room? <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. For all the millennials in the room, here's a, let's do the picture of the office, Moana, the office one. So if you need a photo, <laughs> like this is sometimes how I feel on a Sunday. I'm like, who, what are you going to say? Where are you going? What are you going to do? <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm Dwight Shrew, Michael Scott. Okay. So for all the Gen Zers, we have a Spider-Man one. You're welcome. Okay. There you go. Okay, really trying to reach out here. And the reason I'm going to overdefine this is because my former intern said she didn't really understand the definition. So here we go. Here's a cynical quote that I thought was hilarious. And the fact that I loved it so much made me realize I'm really stuck in this. An apple a day keeps anyone away if you throw it hard enough. <laughs> yeah. And then we have, for everyone in the room, even you, Connor, are you a millennial? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Love you, man. Um, we have emojis. So I looked up what is the emoji that is like the most cynical or sus for all you young Gen Zs in the room. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of young ones in here. Among Us, sus. I was doing a lot of research. I'm 31, okay? Uh, it's the face with the raised eyebrow, and the definition is that it conveys a variety of sentiments, including suspicion, skepticism, concern, consideration, and disapproval. Everyone make the face at me just so I can, we can just play around a little. Yeah, you have a good one. Hers is good. It's like slight. Yeah, it's like, all right. So you know what's really fun when you look up emojis? Like, what emoji should I use for this? They have pairings. 
like wine pairings. Like, it goes well with these emojis. If you ever really want to tell someone how you feel, it pairs well with, I don't know about that. Oh, nice. <laughs> Annoyance or frustration, you can match them if you want. Mild irritation, deadpan, dead eye, yeah. Then we have the side eye suspicion, like a little pissed off and I want you to know it. And then smug skepticism. Take a look, bring it in. Have any of you used these emojis in the last year? No? Oh, everyone, that was resounding. Like, yeah, honestly, I use the smug skepticism because I like my cynicism to make it seem like I'm smart. That's my favorite brand. I don't know about you. <laughs> so now that we've defined it, I want to talk about three things, then I'm going to dive into the scripture. There's not going to be some clever organization here. I want to overdefine it because I don't want you to think this message is not for you. And I don't want you to think that this is the same thing as discernment, as an election, or as guarding your heart, because it's not. So, why are we cynical? What can it look like, and what are its effects? Why are we cynical? Before I dive into that, I have a statistic because I'm so smart and I read the Harvard, Bi Harvard Business Review. I just looked up some things and it popped up, but um, Google. So in 2022, they published an article about cynicism in the workplace. And it's funny because Microsoft, massive company, had this job opening to be a CEO and they weren't getting a lot of applications. And then they realized that there was this like horrible work culture at Microsoft at the time. And they brought in some organizational uh, organizational like professionals that study organizational culture and they had them observe their culture and then make observations so they can make changes because it's not good if you can't hire for your CEO. And what they realized is that they had cynicism was one of the like undergirding aspects of their culture that was tearing it apart. And then employees statistically didn't want work to work there despite the pay. And so the quote or the statistic that they came up with, they said 45% of Americans in 1972 believed that most people can be trusted. But by 2018, that share dropped to 30%. And in 2022, they did an Edelman trust parameter. Nearly 60% of people across 27 countries said their default was to trust, distrust other people. 60% of people across 27 countries, their default was distrust. And then they, um, I'll, I'll go back into that article and what they found out more of. But they're discussing cynicism. And, and so one of the reasons I think that we're cynical is our past pains and hurts. Now, it's funny, a lot of us could probably point to a lot of really good memories in our past, right? Like if you're really forced to go there. But our inclination is actually to go negative. Our inclination, the way that we, hey, how was your weekend? You're probably going to bring forth the first piece of news that is not positive because of the way that our society works. And so some of us have real reasons that we're cynical. Well, I don't trust somebody because I was rejected or I was cheated on or, or my parents would say one thing and do another. Our cynicism is actually grounded in some facts, in, in some reality. And so we think to ourselves, well, well, I've done it as a coping mechanism to protect my heart and to protect myself. And, and so we look back and we're like, I actually have good reason to be cynical. And it's this fear of the future based on a one-sided view of the past combined with feeling on your own. And so we feel cynical because of our past. Our world is moving this way. It's a coping response. You've used it to adapt. You have a lot of good reasons, but it's a, there's a psychological cost to this adaptation. There's a cost to it. And so what can it look like? Here are the three masks that we give it and especially Christians. Now, I want you to write these down, but I want you to circle the one that you relate with the most. The first one is, oh, I'm just discerning. I have really high standards. I have a really high regard for the truth. It's not wrong to have high standards, but God didn't ask you to employ them by weaponizing your mind. He asked you to employ them by asking you to renew your mind and intercede on your hands and knees praying for our body. And so you say, well, I'm discerning. I can come into every space and I can suss out who's not real and who is real. I'm discerning. I'm not cynical. But if your discernment is leading to death, it's not of God. If your discernment is leading to gossip, it's not of God. Or you're mishandling your love and zest for high standards and the truth. Or you're only employing some of your theology. 
And then we have this, and honestly, I resonate with all these. So if you're like, wow, she sucks. Uh, no, <laughs> me too. So that article, let's go back to it. They held a mock, uh, the University of Toronto held a mock job interview where uh, they had half the people interviewing for the job lie uh, and the other half tell the truth. And then they had um, the 85% of the people, or wait, one sec, Casey, get this right. 85% believed that cynics were better equipped to detect liars. So they're like, well, a cynic is probably really good at detecting a liar. And the self-identified cynics were actually less accurate than the non-self-identified cynics. So instead of blindly trusting, they actually blindly mistrusted. And we, we think people are so naive when they blindly trust. Oh, they're so naive, they're just gonna get hurt. But what are we when we buy, blindly mistrust? How are we building God's kingdom if we're blindly mistrusting every person that comes our way? And so then we have the next one, intellection, I'm renewing my mind. We have this hard-earned wisdom. And this article at Tilburg University, 70% of people believe that cynics were generally smarter than non-cynics. And this is my favorite one because there's no better way to protect you kind of being an a-hole than it just being like, I'm just smarter than everybody else. No, I'm not mean, I'm not rude, I just say it like it is and I'm smart. I went to Baylor, right, Lainey? I did not go to Baylor. I'm just going to rip on Lainey all night. 70% said they believed this, and then the, the cynics in this test didn't perform as well as the non-cynics on cognitive and social tests. But people will continue to be cynical as long as we reward them for being smart. Instead of calling out divisiveness in ourselves and in other people, gossip, ruthless critique with no information, assumptions based on one thing you see when that person has an entire life you know not of. And we're the most cynical of the people up here. And I just hope that that's not, oh, I want to hear Sean, I want to hear Doug, I like them more, this, this, this speculation. That has to die in our church. The way we talk about the people that are up here putting themselves out there and trying to teach the word of God faithfully, have a high regard for truth and theology, for sure. But to tarnish somebody based on no knowledge, to speak ill will, come on. I hear it time and time again in the lobby. It's cynical and it, it's speaking death into our church. It's what it is. So, next. <laughs> The third one, protection. I'm just guarding my heart, man. I'm just guarding my heart against anyone that could come in or hurt me. And I just know that they probably will because I know people, I said this in counseling the other day, I was like, well, I'm just right and I just know people and I have 30 years of experience knowing that most of the time people actually fail you and they're not trustworthy. I said that a week ago and I felt great about it. <laughs> And she just gave me this so confused look. And I was like, well, that's why I pay you. <laughs> you could be judgmental. So what this does is it makes you really judgmental because you're always assessing people. Because in order to guard your heart, but it's really not the biblical guarding of the heart, it's more like a vault that someone has to be perfect, which no one can be and no one is. We all know that. Not even ourselves can be perfect, but we put up this vault and then we're judging people all the time. And you know what happens when we judge? It always creates distance, always. Because you're creating a narrative, a self-fulfilling prophecy and a confirmation bias, which is here's what I'm gonna see and then you start to look for it everywhere. I'm gonna see failure and I'm going to see rejection and I'm going to see when people make promises and don't come through and then guess what? You find it. Guess what? You'll find it. If you go looking, you'll find it. And then we ignore the other half of the story, which is generosity and love and acts of kindness, things that real people are doing every single day, motivated by the gospel, motivated by love for humanity. And then we reject people before they can reject us. And we wonder, we wonder why we can't connect. Because if I can reject you first, you can't reject me. Or at least I could say that I did it first. Or if I know you're going to break up with me, I did this in middle school on Valentine's Day. I was like, they're like, he's going to break up with you. I was like, tell him it's over. I didn't even have the courage to do it myself. My gosh. 
I've really grown since then. Um, yeah, it prioritizes the self, it villainizes the other, and it dehumanizes somebody else, which is to take a crack at the image of God in somebody. And so what are its effects? What are the effects on ourselves, our communities, of being cynical? First of all, it's contagious. It's contagious. Cynicism breeds more cynicism. There is nothing better than standing next to your best friend and saying really mean, sarcastic things. In the back of like, I, oh God, I'm the worst. I don't know what it is about bridal showers. I'm just in the back, I'm like, thank God there's good food. Like, it's like, I think it's just because <laughs> they're so boring to me. Um, sarcasm can actually also be a form of cynicism. And I think sometimes sarcasm is really fun, but other times it's really just you being super mean, but being clever about it. And I'm about to get into the Bible. You're like, are we going to do the Bible thing? Yes. I just really want to define this because I want to make sure that nobody in this room thinks that this isn't you. Because I want you to get free from it. Because I want you to see the world differently. Because I want God to invade your heart and for you to have a hope for a future. I want God to invade the pain in your past instead of letting you have a lens of cynicism moving forward, a lens of hope that our God is alive and he's not done writing your story. Do you understand why I'm over defining this? is I don't want one person to leave this room not being moved or touched by this message because I really, as I was praying about it, I felt like God was like, hammer the peg all the way in. People need to be set free from this. And so here are the effects. It's, it's the self-fulfilling prophecy. You focus on the worst. And here's the illustration I got. You're either the armchair athlete. We have the Olympics coming up. How many of you love critiquing professional athletes? Me. I love it. I'm like, idiot. Uh, Should have done this. I'm like, popcorn all over. Like, every snack available, like three different drinks, like a poppy, uh, what are the other, a lemoncello, a LaCroix, like there's a triple over there, and then I just got chips, and then Taco Bell's on my DoorDash on the way. And I'm watching Caitlin Clark, I'm like, boo, bad layup, who misses that? And then I'm watching, <laughs> what's her name, Simone Biles, I'm like, didn't, <laughs> she did a step, watch out for that step when they land, I'm like, armchair athletes who don't have the courage to actually get in the game and play and build something worth building. You know, you know how hard it is to build a Jenga tower? It's so much easier to accidentally knock it over. It takes no courage, it takes no thought, it takes no risk. Or, or you're the athlete in the game who lacks humility and can't play well with others. I was that forward sometimes. I'm like, oh, you didn't pass to me because you just didn't I assume the worst. You just didn't want me. You just didn't think I was good enough. You just don't want me to have the ball. Or maybe they just thought of a better option. Which one are you? And there's a quote by Peter Adam. It says, cynicism gives us the luxury of being right without the responsibility of working for change. Do we want to build the church of God together? Are we going to sit back, and cross our arms, and look at the people that are and say it's not good enough? And call it discernment. And call it discernment. That was me, especially in my early 20s. I would sit in the back at that young adult ministry and God would do so much in my heart and then I would leave and I would critique the church up and down and left and right and I would never serve and I would never get involved and I would never meet anybody and I would never get prayer and I thought it was because I had a high standard and I was discerning. Man, get some skin in the game. Let's build this thing together. I didn't say we're all gonna be perfect. We're gonna make some mistakes. But luckily, we aren't each other's rock. Jesus is our rock and our foundation, our unfailing father, and he's holy, which means he can't sin against us. And not only that, he's alive. And he's building, and he's coming back. And so I'm going to get into the Bible now. Oof. Now nah, I won't go. Youth, it's a 25-minute clock, but okay, here we go. All right, so we started with cynicism as a coping mechanism and now it's the lens through which we see everything. And here it's so sinister because we don't know we're stuck in it and we don't know to what degree. But it's not new. I think it's so funny we're in 2024 and we're like, these are all these new things. No, it's not new. Cynicism was a part of the first sin in Genesis when Jesus said, did God really say? Did God really say? Do we have the emoji? <laughs> I just see it. I mean, it was a serpent, but like, I feel like it still could have happened. Did God, did God really say not to eat from that tree? 
drenched in cynicism because what the serpent's trying to do in Genesis, and we'll read it in a second, is to get Eve to question the motive and the character of God. He's trying to get her to distrust God. And so we think this is brand new, but it's not. It was at the beginning. It no longer has the final say, but it still can grip us. And so we're going to dive into Genesis. Now, before that, we're going to kick off Genesis. It's the beginning of the Bible. God is creating a lot of things. God's honestly, for all my Gen Zers, he's cooking out there. He is, I hate myself. He is water. He's like sky, light, moon, sun. I don't think he's doing it like this, but it's fine. He's creating. He's creating the animals. He's creating the ocean. God is going for it. And he says, it's good. It's good. It's good. Every single day of creation. And then on the sixth day, he says, uh, in Genesis 1, 27, he creates man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And then he goes on and he looked at everything that he made in verse 31. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning on the sixth day. And then God had one rule in this garden of Eden where he walked side by side with his children, where there was no division, no separation. They were his children. And Genesis 5, uh, 2, 15, he looks at the man he puts in the garden of Eden. And he says, work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat every tree in the garden. You're going to steward every animal. You're going to name them. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat, you shall surely die. Now in Genesis 3, 1 to 13, it picks up. It's going to be a big chunk of verses, so buckle up. Now, the serpent was more crafty or deceptive than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say... Did he actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. Do you hear the sarcasm? Do you hear it? You know, you'll not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. AKA, God lied to you. And he's withholding goodness from you. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, and then he makes her a false promise. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. Did God actually say, the first thing the enemy wants to do is to get her to question the motives, the benevolence of our good God. And here's the annoying part. God does all of that creating. He says, it's good. He says, it's good. He makes Adam and Eve. He says, look what I have given you. Look what I have given you to steward. And one question from a serpent on the ground dismantles all of his credibility in their minds. Seven days of creation very good. Steward it. Here's a gift. Here's a wife. Here's life. One question dismantles his entire credibility. And you think cynicism isn't dark. You think it can't touch you. You think it's not something that brings death. And then he, the, when Satan says to her, you will surely not die, he makes a false promise. Now, I'm going to go into verse 8. When they heard the sound of the Lord, so basically the fig leaves happen. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees and of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I feel like that was the moment where they used to walk with God and God used to sound like something and it wasn't something that made them afraid. And so so what happened here that now all of a sudden the sound of God makes them afraid because Satan got them to see different 
So they did different. So they heard God differently. Satan got them to see the tree different. If you rewind, it says, oh, then the women, woman saw that the tree was good for food. So then they did different, and now they hear God differently. They're hiding. They're afraid. And it picks up, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave me. Do you hear it again? The cynicism and God's character and goodness. She gave me the fruit of the tree I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Where are you? Who told you? Don't you hear God's love in this moment? That they were, he knew that they were gonna have to be separated because he's a holy God. And sin cannot be together with holy God. And so now he's, he's, he goes from being their father to effectively needing to banish them from the garden, and they're now orphans. When they were walking with him in the cool of the day, it was one cynical question that made them an orphan. And so at the heart of sin is this. God doesn't love me. He isn't for me. He's holding out on me. It's coming into agreement with a lie when there was seven days of creation, seven days of benevolence. And God's response is this. Are you ready? Don't you think that they deserved so much cynicism as his response, but his response is a promise. It's actually him addressing the serpent in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It was their cynicism, cynicism of the father that made them orphans. And I don't know how many of you today are walking around. I would correlate cynicism with the spirit of an orphan. Oh, it's just me, and I'm the only one who's going to look out for me, and no one really cares, and it's just me versus the world. And so I guard, and I protect, and I have an election, and I'm discerning, and I sit in the back, and I am always wondering when I'm going to get screwed over. And, Ben, you can come up. So how, young adult, do you get unstuck? Because by now, my guess is that you're like, this is the thing for me. <laughs> this is some part of how I've seen the world. How am I going to get unstuck? Now, the opposite of cynicism really is having a lens of hope. So how do you move from a lens of cynicism, which is the way of seeing the world rooted in half the story, an assumption of an impure motive, to hope in a way that's not naive and fake? You become like children. And that is when we're going to go to Matthew 18, 1 to 4. And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put in the midst of them. And I already read it up top, but he says, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The answer is to become like children. Now you read this verse and you're like, okay, so if I'm a disciple, I'm like, become like a child. Uh, up till now, I've been following all God's commandments. I've matured. I, I, all the parts of growing into an adult has actually made me somebody that has followed a rabbi well. Is Jesus asking me to just simply change my disposition? Is he simply just asking me to be more trusting? Is he laying out a list? Be more trusting. Ask for more things. Uh, believe more. Like, is Jesus just laying those things out first and foremost? No, no. Yes, when we read that, we have the gospels, so yes. But the disciples in this time, what Jesus was saying is he wasn't telling them to change their disposition. He wasn't giving them a long list. He was telling them that he was about to go and change their position, their orientation towards God that was broken in the garden when they became orphans. He was about to go to the cross and restore what was once broken. Give them a father that they were no longer separated from. That they actually could turn to look in the eyes with no curtain, with no in-between, with no sacrifice, with nothing to earn, nothing to prove, and become a child again under a good and holy God, under a father. And so we, when we are stuck in cynicism, turn and become 
like children. Now the big point is instead, I think we think to ourselves, always oh, asking them not to come as an adult, not to come as an adult, but to come as a child. He's saying, no, don't you ever again come to me as an orphan. Come as a child. Some of us have a spirit of an orphan in this room. Like God has abandoned us or doesn't see us. Maybe it's because of your past. You've put a period on the bad things that have happened or the people that have hurt you. And you've said, I've actually, thanks Jesus, I actually have my own way now. And it's to block everybody else out and to be perfect or wait for perfect. And it's just never going to happen. Some of you need to remember that you are children. And so because you are children, we need to have a disposition of a child. And so why are they no longer an orphan? Because God made good on his promise when he had them leave Eden and he looked to the serpent and he said, your heel's gonna be crushed. My, a heel is gonna crush your head. And, and then Jesus, after he tells them to come like children, he ends up marching to the cross and dying for the sin that we couldn't pay for. And, and, and I picture him on the cross and he says it is finished, but I picture him when he's resurrected. Before he's resurrected, he's in, separate from God, carrying all of sin, paying for it. And this little whisper, did God really say? Yeah, he did. He did really say. Did God really say, you're done? He did really say, he did come through on his promises. He did crush the head of the enemy. He did win. He was victorious. He did really say. And so my question for you tonight, would you be cynical of your cynicism? Would you be cynical of the enemy in your life? Would you be cynical of your own disposition towards the world? And would you turn, which means repent, turn a different direction and look into the eyes of a father who is calling you to be a person of hope. We are called to be people of hope, young adult, despite our circumstance, despite the world around us, because our God is alive. And so as you stand, I want to give you the secret sauce to getting out of cynicism. You could stand, sorry. I'm so bad at that. A month ago, I was like, get up <laughs> as you stand. Here's the secret sauce. Are you ready? This is what I'm learning. Cynicism and compassion cannot coexist because cynicism says no one cares and you don't care and compassion says, I see you, I see your pain, I see you're hurting and I care enough to do something about it. I care enough to do something about it. Compassion is a strong feeling of sympathy and sadness for the suffering of others and a desire to alleviate that suffering. And so when God had them leave the garden, he didn't just say, ah, oh, bummer. He had compassion. He wanted to alleviate what had been done. And tonight as you stand here feeling like an orphan, feeling like he doesn't see you, feeling like you're too far gone or your past is too far bad and you're so mad and you're so bitter, but deep down you're so grieved. Some of you need to bring your pain before a compassionate God. Some of you need to turn, which means repent, which means have courage, turn around and see that God is compassionate towards you. He doesn't just see your suffering and say, good luck. He sees your suffering and says, your story is not done. Even while you lay your head on your pillow, I am going to work on your behalf. You might not see it now. You might not see it in five years. You might not see it till he comes back, but he's redeeming all things. You have a good reason to be cynical. You might have a bunch of good reasons to be cynical. But the cross is a better reason to be hopeful. Come on. Cynicism says no one cares. Compassion says I do and I'm working on it. Some of you need to turn, have courage, repent, face Jesus, bring him your pain, bring him your sorrow. Some of you need to cry for a long time. Some of you do. Instead of burying your grief and being angry, some of you need to be vulnerable before a holy God and let him sit with you. And then become like a child. In humility, would you receive healing tonight? 
I don't care how healed you think you are. Everyone in this room needs healing tonight. If it's of a mindset, it's of a mindset. If it's of your past, it's of your past. But tonight, you're gonna get healing. You are not an orphan. Your story is not done. And we are going to go into this song and it's gonna say, death is never going to hold you because he is the only one holding on to you. Cynicism might have had you in its hands, but Jesus says, release her in Jesus' name. Release him in Jesus' name because I'm the only one that gets to call them son. I'm the only one that gets to call her daughter. Come on, Red Roxy. Let's worship. <laughs> 